bus came by, he got on. The Grateful Dead channel now invites you to spend time with a man who spent more than 30 years as a member of the Grateful Dead family, Steve Parrish. Steve would answer if he only knew how. The music, memories, and insights begin now with the Big Steve Hour on Sirius XM's Grateful Dead channel. And now, here's Big Steve Parrish. Hello, everybody out there. This is Big Steve, and we are at Dead & Company. And you know, when we talk about the magic of our whole community and how everybody gives their heart and soul to it and keeps it rolling along, you know, I just finished doing a show down here at the Loose Lucy Lounge and got to talk to a lot of people, and each and every one of us does our part in different ways. I always say I was the luckiest guy in the world to do the Jerry Garcia Band and the Grateful Dead with Jerry. And hanging out with Jerry that much, you know, I learned a lot of his soulfulness because he would always tell me, Steve, be nice. Will you please be nice for a minute here? And today, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to John Mayer. Hey there. And it is an honor to have you on here, John, because, you know, I've been studying and watching what you do and listening to you also talk on serious radio and things like that. And I'm overwhelmed by how you're trying to deal with this, you know, because it's not easy. No, no. I think trying is the word. Yeah. It's the optimum word there. And it's it's been so beautiful to watch this and feel this grow year after year after year both in the world around what this is and also in my relationship with it i mean i think if i had known how special this was to so many people mm -hmm. before i jumped on with dead and company i don't think i would have been able to do the gig without freaking out i i think my ignorance for lack of a better word was sort of a, a protective shield around me so I could just think about playing. And then every year that it gets deeper and deeper, I realized that this is a much larger responsibility than just playing the songs the right way. You know, it's, it's, and, and it's really like an honor that I hope I will have retroactively earned. You well, know, I'm sure that, you know, your techniques, you brought them to the shows at first, you know, and, through that the music seems to take over a magic sometimes you know and i see guys with a lot of great technique playing you know and and jerry always said to me he said you know there's a million guys that can play guitar steve as good as i can and i said i've never seen one but yeah okay, it, buddy, you, know. you know there's two ways of looking at that right there's like there's what you're able to do uh technically with your instrument right whether in a really physical way and that's only really 20 percent of the story and the other 80 percent is why you're doing what you're doing how you're doing what you're doing when you're doing what you're doing and also this x factor of like what you seek to get out of it uh and that's kind of where i'm living is both a, um, a listener of music and a maker of music now is like that x factor of what is it you're trying to get versus give while you play and i think listening back to all those shows and i still listen to those shows it's yeah. a real beautiful balance of um playing guitar like all guitar soloists are looking to play i all want to play right but there was a real divorce of ego when he played uh, like just playing he was half awake half like a lucid dream right yes. like oh yeah like if you're yeah. having a lucid dream you've got to do two things at once you've got to be excited enough to know you can move around in the dream but you've got to stay asleep enough to keep the dream going and now we realize we've not we're not talking about guitar technique anymore right we're talking about the intention of what you're doing and what it means to you while you're playing and that is what made him better than anyone else I, that well, you know i always call it like the fourth or fifth dimension almost you know because when jerry or any musician that i've ever seen and i i've played with jerry because i played drums and mm -hmm. he used to come in so early and sit there and you know uh play guitar all day as we set up and then we play with him you know and he he when you play a mus an instrument you you get high you know? mm -hmm. it's, it's something that you almost start having out of body experiences mm -hmm. you know and i always noticed that the first thing when i first came around in the late 60s that when if anybody went near jerry's amp or touched it he you know, he almost looked around to you you know it was mm -hmm. like he had eyes in the back of his head almost right 
And I started to realize that when a musician is playing, he's in a place of vulnerability almost, you know, where mm -hmm. he's not he's not aware of, of where he is around it. I, well, I know you, you like that. The great you, ones, you know. the great ones leave a little bit. Yes, yes. The great ones, um, the great anybodies uh, transcend the knowledge of what they have in any given moment, and the language of their art goes away, and it just becomes just some tongue. It's not, you know, great photographers don't talk to you while they're shooting you about their f-stop right. and yeah. their shutter speed. You know, I worked with Annie Leibovitz one time. Oh yeah, she you, goes pop, 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 pop. Now I'm sure that what she's doing in there is very, very technical, but she's figured out a way to just slip through that and just do the art, and that's where I'm getting to now. Like. And I think it's a function of time, right? Like, when I first... Like, every tour has been different in my relationship with the listeners and with Deadheads and stuff. Like, the first one was, could I ever do this? Like, proof of concept, you know? And then it was like, okay, prove that you understand the songs more than just one way to play each song, right? And now it's like... People have heard me play these songs enough times that I don't have to prove in any given moment of any show that I know how to do this. So it's very freeing that now it's almost a Ouija board approach. Mm -hmm. The solo's coming up, right? And every guitar solo, when the solo's coming up, they get tense. They get ready to blow. And Jerry never did It sounded to me like he never did that. When this time came, he just whoosh, like Jedi stuff, well, you, you right? Know, that's interesting because he had a lot of stage fright, John. You know, I mean, he was always nervous before he went on, and he would start doing a different ritual. It changed over the years to different things, but he really would get nervous, you know, to get out there. But once he stepped out there, and I've seen this with a lot of players, you know, then they go out there and and they play and then their their courage comes mm -hmm. up they're they're playing with everybody else out there mm -hmm. and when you think that you could have a solo just be something that is okay this is your part and it becomes mundane into the song it sucks man and he didn't ever like that yeah we get we get we get, all guitar players get ready yeah. to solo they're, they're, they're watching their they're right ready to jump in and yeah, and right. if you're getting ready for a solo <laughs> you're already beginning to overthink the yes. solo yes and this is the first tour that i've done this is what i practiced at home right i don't have to consider any other factor do they like me do they not like me the minds have been made up one way or another that's the freedom i'm talking about and now when it comes time to play a solo i just do it and it's a real lesson in letting go and accepting that you've got, oh, I don't know, 20 songs a night and you don't have to win all 20. They just need you to, to, to have something divine three or four times. You know, that's what they're looking for. And the only way to do that is to commit to the unknowing of what you're about to do. And you're dealing with a guy who's very knowing. You know, I'm yeah. very aware. Yes, you are. And it has been a the joy of my life to be taught by this music, to be taught how to become less aware of things that don't matter to be aware of. And that is when you get solos that aren't even really solos. They're just these beautiful little expressions. I, I think that one of the things I'm fascinated with is the misnomers and the myths that get thrown into the mix when um, gen new generations and more and more people come in yeah. to try to, to try to yeah. copy something or re replicate it. Uh, he, his playing, and I guess have to imagine that he as a person was so vast that. And Jimi Hendrix is like that too. You know, you try to copy Jimi Hendrix and you'll miss one whole part of the thing, and then you're just smashing a guitar and you go, "You forgot about this and that and that and that and that." And there's just all of this. Uh, beauty in in what's going on and it taught me uh, oh what I was saying was one of the big misnomers is that oh he was just noodling well some of our favorite recordings are him playing the vocal line from a song and so I started about a tour and a half two tours ago going don't solo the embellishment of the thing just sing the melody number one he like sang the melody on his guitar a lot of the time this the solo to broke down palace is the melody to broke down palace. And, and I think a lot of guitar players go oh it's time to go it's time to launch he also didn't do all that much of that in our favorite recordings right like 
also, I think the blues element to what he was doing you know, he was massive. Do amazing like, you tell me like that. You know, we, we would go. I was really lucky enough to go with him to a lot of sessions where people had, you know, uh, prepared their record and they wanted Jerry to just come in. He could listen to a song one time and play this amazing part that fit in. You know, uh, I'm particularly was blown away one time when we went to Ornette Coleman. You know, and. It was just Ornette, me, Jerry, and Ornette's son, and, and this guy in the studio mixing, brought a little amp, went direct in the board, mm -hmm. Jerry listened to these complicated songs, and he jumped right in. Then, John, I wish I had this recorder with me, when him and Ornette were sitting right next to me, and they started talking about how, just what you're talking about, you know, how that comes out of you at the right time, mm -hmm. and you do it at the wrong time, you jump in, then you're a jumper, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not going to work for you. You've got to be sliding into it, you That's know, right. and, and coming in there. And, and his touch was a lot like yours, believe it or not, because what, I know you went through this. I don't even have to ask you. I know you went through a time where you never put your guitar down. You were no, sitting around. No. And Jerry would always tell me, you know, you literally sit on the toilet playing. I took the guitar out last night. Exactly. And I got back from a show. Right. Um, and my fingers hurt, so I was like, I better take I got to go to sleep. But, yeah. I mean, I grew up. Uh, coming home from school playing guitar and I remember we'd watch TV I'd watch TV oh, with the guitar up, with the yeah. guitar and during the commercials yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah when the commercials came on you hit mute and sold but played and played and played and I gotta tell you I don't know if I've ever explained this to anyone the simple joy of having an instrument on your tummy that you are not currently playing but yeah. could at any moment the the uh, the freedom of that all I have to do is turn up the amp and start playing and there it is and I can stop and then there it's it's gone and I can start almost like singing you know like it, it's always astounded me that singers also just talk and that people who are talking can also sing no. <laughs> yeah. now I'm singing now oh, yeah well Jerry always said the hardest thing in the world is singing and playing the guitar at the same yeah. time but he was one of the greats he said it was so hard to do but yet he got it down you Hendrix know? was another great Hendrix player Hendrix was somebody that Jerry looked up to in that way yeah. you know in those days because he Jimmy never put his guitar down for a yeah. certain period of time too it's when you put it down yeah. when all the other shit starts happening That's right. you know? and both guys who played yeah. the same guitar for very long periods of time and when you play the same guitar you can learn every last nuance I used to be a big time guitar switcher every song switch a uh -huh. guitar switch a guitar and yeah. you lose a relationship with the instrument yeah, Jerry wouldn't do that no. yeah. he, he'd stick with one where Bobby would switch you know and, and Jerry understood that you know but he even felt for a long time that the acoustic guitar he wouldn't play it because he said my chops are electric now and I'm not going to play acoustic you know uh, what, what are then the he most, switched back yeah I mean, one back. of the most demoralizing things a guitar player can do is to listen to Jerry Garcia play the acoustic guitar. <laughs> it's demoralizing. It is, man. Because, you know, we've spent so much time trying to chase the gear that when you realize he picks up a D28 or something and can do that same thing, you go, oh, okay. This is pressure and attack and shapes of fingertips and strength of hands and timing between That's strong hands for what he had, you know, but he, he was missing that finger and he overcompensated. He never dropped a pick, John. I mean, I, I can only remember one time when I found a pick on the floor and his stuff. You know, it, it's just a natural thing, but he held on to it. He overcompensated and held on to that stump and he just, and just, he never dropped it. And I think it was a thing of pride for him or something, I'm not sure, but losing his finger like he did it, you know, with a brotherly accident, and I know the story really well. He was shocked, you know, of course, mm -hmm. as a child, not even realizing the finger was gone. And then when it was, he, you see, Jerry always felt he had a lot of insecurities too, you know, but that we all have, of course, mm -hmm. in life. But the guitar gave him a newfound way to communicate with people. Well, you can hear you know, it. I, I, and, and he loved it. He loved it. I, I want to say something. Uh, I say this to people sometimes. I go, I lost an artist. You lost a friend. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, how do you deal with that? I, have, I feel like I have questions in my mind for you. How do you deal with painful. sharing so but, but, but sharing so many... This ex sharing sharing a relationship that you had with someone personally that other people speak about as personally as you do because in some ways in some components there is that deep personal connection. How do you reconcile the guy you knew with everyone else's version of the guy that is in a way to them interpretively as important to them as it is to you? But but you knew the guy and they know the guy through the music. How do you do? Well, you know because we were together so often and. One of the first days that we were together at the Matrix, 
but he was sitting there and he was playing. He, you know, he, I set up his twin reverb and we put the stage was over here. We're sitting on the benches. The guy left because he was there so early. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the moment was dark in the club. There was a little crack in the door, this light hitting us, you know, from the street on, on uh, Van Ness. And coming in, and Jeremy's sitting there lit up like this, and he's playing all like say anything and, and see if I can't play it you know he, he was incredible he played every kind of music every genre I could come up with my mind and so I said to him Stardust you know and he played it instantly he said that's my mother's favorite song and my uncle Mitchell Parrish wrote the words with Hoagie Carmichael the Stardust and, oh. and Deep Purple and Stars Fell on Alabama and and 500 standards. He was a Tin Pan Alley guy. So that hit the score in Jerry, you know, and so we got closer and closer as friends. Also, we realized we loved old movies, and so we continued. Like, Muir and I now are doing this project with FX, and it's because we carry that torch for Jerry now. He always wanted to put down somehow the lightning in a bottle that was our lives later on. Mm -hmm. So to get to your point here, I started thinking about it, you know, so many, he never wanted to be worshipped like a demigod or a god, you know, and so I tried to tell people these stories about him, that he was a man, he, was, he, he had his feet deep in the mud, trust me, you know, he was just a guy, you know, and, and people were so, when he played on stage, I mean, back in the days, he glowed, he almost glowed with this smile and this sunshine coming off him, when you were in trouble, he was there for you on every level as a friend, you know. Well, how can you, I, I say people play like they are, I talk a lot, and I play a lot of notes. I'm trying to talk less in my life and mean more. I'm trying to play fewer notes and mean more. And if you're an aggressive guy, you play aggressive. And if you're a meek guy, you play in a sensitive, gentle way. And I, I, I feel like his touch on the guitar was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, not, and again, what I mean by what it is you're looking out of what you're to do, or what it is you're looking for out of what you're playing, he wasn't looking for anything ego driven please think I'm, awards, please yeah. think I'm great yeah. I've never heard a guitar player play in such an open way where they're willing to make mistakes they're playing out of the sheer gift they've been given to play it's the only way that um, millions of people who don't play a guitar can listen to a guitar player play for hours I promise you there's no one else who can do that unless you did play the guitar and so for me I have this dual experience I have the listener and I have the guitar player and I go back and forth as I listen I want to explain to you for a minute what it looks like in my head the music is the landscape. It's almost like a video game, and you and it side scrolls, and the the band is making these beautiful platforms and pulleys and these hills and jumps and pits and slides and loops, and Jerry is like in a little biplane flying over all of it, and he's responding to what's going underneath, and I just look at the landscape go by, yeah. and as a guitar player, I'm always aware of what I would have done if I were playing along, and I'm always wrong. And he's always playing a better version, a more sophisticated, more open, more kindly version of a guitar part. There's never, to me, and by the way, again, I'm speaking of the relationship I have through listening as a guitar player. I believe guitar players have a bond the way nurses have a bond or anyone else has right, a bond. Right. And to listen to the relationship between what I would do as a guitar player and what most guitar players would do as a guitar player and what he chooses to do over any given moment I think it is joyous and blissful and just pure f it's the most fun I giggle I giggle when I hear these choices that are so far out of the realm of this kind of macho guitar play I like that. and I just watch the topography go by as he goes up and over and down and loops and can stay in the same part of the guitar yeah. neck yeah. and continue to express yeah. in a way that you go tell me more tell me more tell me more tell me more and most guitar players are going listen to me think I'm great think I'm great <laughs> he no, was he just was a poser like that oh you can't even tell you know and some guys you know put the guitar behind their head and play and yeah. all those gimmicks you know yeah. like he never liked he didn't even really like lights when they started coming in he said just leave it you don't get to that until you're you're made man yeah, yeah, yeah. in this world and uh, through 
there was no pedals, John, when we started. You know, there weren't even pedals out there. He did it with his hands. When I got him his first pedal, we were at a Jerry Garcia band show, and he said, Steve, go, go down and get me a wah-wah pedal. You know, and he started playing that wah-wah pedal. And I was telling you the other night that he immediately thought about his loop system. His mind was so into uh, amps and guitars and circuitry, learning around it all. And he didn't really like playing high on acid that much, because in those days we had strobe tuners, and it was hard to tune up. We had to really pay attention. The pig would sit there, I'd give me an A. Right, right. right. And it was hard to stay in tune. And so the best work wasn't done during those times, mm -hmm. you know. But what it did was it forged in him a sort of a way that you could, you would cling to the music. He always would cling to music in his life for solace when he would have problems, you know. And you mentioned Andy Leibovitz. Now, one time they did a, uh, they had a flame together, him and Andy. Oh. She went on the road with us. She took pictures of him for Rolling Stone and Stinson Beach, where we all live. And when I did my book, I knew she would have pictures. Immediately had this great picture of me and Jerry on the cover of, of my book because she became deeply friends with him, you know, and he had a way of touching kids and dogs. If he would sit there in the studio or something, people would come in, the little kids would always come to him, and dogs, too. Very dogs? Serious. Yeah. He had some kind of charisma uh, as a human being that was almost exuberant, you know, exuded out of him. And he had to be really careful that he didn't seduce people too much, you know, with uh, his talk. So he never spoke on stage after a while, you know. Because you even know this too, I'm sure. People hang on your word. Yeah. I noticed the other night you were wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said to myself, he would love that, you know, because Jerry and I, we went to Disneyland the first time together. You were not allowed to go there in this late 60s with long hair. And Jerry loved Walt Disney, man. He and I went to see Fantasia, and he, he was just a big Disney fan of all the movies and, and all that Walt did. But. When we went to Disneyland that day, you know, he was just like a kid going on all the rides. We went on everything they had, and and I was thinking about that way that he was so much fun that he could go around it everywhere. Mm -hmm. and go in New York, we travel around all the place. When people started getting to where they were so popular, they wouldn't let him be Jerry almost anymore. He had to stay locked up. Almost, yeah, you know, he hated that. He still went around, but he, he got more complicated. But um, his love for the guitar was so reflected in how he taught us, you know, how to love instruments and any string instrument you touched. I remember bringing a Kyoto to the studio and, you know, hanging it up on the wall. He took it down and was tuning it up and playing it. You know, these are difficult instruments to play. Yeah. The pedal steel, he always thought that he was not good at it. You know, I thought he was great. He yeah, no, I thought he was great. Put, put three pedals on it. He wouldn't ever let me put the eight pedals that came with it, you know. And he loved, uh, you know, with, the, with banjo, too, it was great. And this kind of thing that he had was a gift mandolin he could play anything but he never wanted people to worship him you know and that part bugged him a little mm -hmm. bit so i feel that it is a good thing to talk about him and to tell people stories about some yeah, and humanize it, yeah. you know, and humanize it. Yeah. but the grateful dead is not it's something that goes beyond a lot of bands i had yorma on the show not too long ago and he said to me Steve, do you realize you know there's nothing like the Grateful Dead? Well, there's they nothing. Hated. There is no other band that no. has this kind of a thing that they touch people like this. You know, no, my my involvement in it is such that like I've never felt anything like this to the extent to which we had a show. We had two shows last Friday and Saturday up at Shoreline, and we had a day off in between these two shows at the Bowl. I've never felt more connected to the rest of the band, the crew, and the crowd who I know moved their way down to L.A. and was going to come to the bowl and were, were uh, all resting at the same time. We were all napping. at the, I felt like the tour was still going, that the show is Very always happening, Very and that all of us, from the person on the lawn to me, were all in pajamas that day because we had two more shows. Hello. And, Hello. and I felt the sense of togetherness even when I was alone in my own house, and I went... This is the biggest thing I've ever felt in my life. I mean, that 
that really? level of connection, yeah, I've never felt anything. Well, like I don't know. Can you you can tell me this, you know, because I, I've had associated with many other bands, but we would sometimes all have the same dream. We'd come oh, in on the road, totally, yeah. and Jerry would be talking about a dream. I said, I swear to God, I had the same dream. I can totally because yeah. we were in hotels, we were at, at the places together, we traveled together, we hung out together, you know, and so you start getting these these connections, you know, and that went out to the audience, and they're mm -hmm. invisible connections that I believe the I, universe lays out there for us. It's, you know? I've never expected, for someone, you know, my parents were educators, uh -huh. I was very uh, strict in my mind, very analytical, very everything has to add up, and I still am to some extent, and I'm glad I am in certain regards, but this has brought to me a whole other palette of colors in the way that not just make music but like see the world mm -hmm. uh, I just it's just proof that you never know what's coming you never know you think you might be done figuring out new ways to look at the world and then bop something hits you and you're doing this and Every year gets deeper for me, and I think every year gets deeper from the for the culture kind of around Dead and Company right now, yes, yes. where it's just at a boil right now. You can feel oh, everyone in town feel the knows it's happening. It's amazing, and uh, you know, in the Jerry Garcia band was such a beautiful thing because there he played the songs that he wanted to mm -hmm. touch to. Mm -hmm. A lot of soulful stuff, a lot of Dylan, a mm -hmm. lot of the band, a lot of Rolling Stones. You know, he would try all kinds of gospel stuff and different things, even bluegrass and different things that he adopted into it. And so I realized, you know, that music, he started as a child, look, going to music at a jukebox in his mom's bar to soothe the pain of being a kid who lost his dad at three years old, raised by his mother, and, you know, and we're all created and forged, I would say, by our lives, you know, and he had a tough time as a kid, you know, and but he overcame it with music. You, you know? build a little room that no one yeah, can find you exactly, in your head, and that room exactly. gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and safer and bigger, and you get stronger and stronger. And look, that has its own downsides to it when you become so good that you actually don't need to follow any rules, right? Like, any time I decided I would want to dislodge from the cult, from the customs of being a normal person, I could get away with it. You know, I'm 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 trying to hold on to being a normal person but and not to say that he didn't but when you grow up where you have uh, I always say like you, you make an artist when you have like uh, education and pain you get smart enough to understand something and then you get left alone or hurt or your feelings get hurt you need to escape and you can build this you take the sort of pain and w w whatever you've been taught you know and you make your own little blend of a way to, to protect yourself and musicians do that. Musician, I don't think you'll get far if you just want to meet girls. I yeah. just don't think that's enough. Yeah. I think you build yourself. I mean, I look at all these things online, and they probably are helpful, and I take nothing away from them. But like the motivational Instagram posts, don't let anybody. Da -da -da -da. I didn't have that growing up. But I would play the guitar, and the guitar would tell me, don't let people tell you you're not good enough. The guitar would, I've never said this before. I would play on a day where my feelings were particularly hurt, like really hurt, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that guitar would say, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Listen to you play right now. And it never got to my head. But well, artists yeah, for all make us. a room, and the room yeah. grows all the way. And then one day you can't leave the room, and you go, "Well, we'll get them next lifetime on anything else." Do you think? Do you think that Jerry saw it as a fair trade in terms of his his ability to enjoy the world, his quality of life, uh, versus what he was able to achieve as a musician? Was that a fair trade? Yeah, time, you, think? you know what? He was always so as a human being. He was really great. You know. Uh, if you had a problem, he would help you with it. And his, his, his thing he would always say was, don't lay your bummers on other people, you know. Mm -hmm. And yet he got so many people would come to yeah. him and lay all their stuff on him, you know. And he took a certain course where he would always tell me, you know, look, let's do this benefit to the umpteenth degree. He would never say no. I and mean, we would do so much beautiful work. You know, we played for the Black Panthers. We played for the Angels. We played for the uh, people you wouldn't expect, you know, right. but also for a lot of good things for Indians when they were trying to make their lives independent of things of the government. He gave every inch he could when he knew his guitar was, was, was a way to get there, you know, to help people. And he also had a thing where if you ever 
you know, had your problem, he would come to you. Like, I had a tragedy one time where I lost my family at a New Year's run, uh, a wife and two kids in a car accident, and the band all came to my house, and they said, Steve, you know, we'll cancel the show tonight. I said, no, that's where I got to be. Yeah. We got to be at the show. You guys got to play for me, and I got to be there, because that's our church on yeah. us, you know? And it was like, took the pain away with all the deadheads, you know, there consoling and everybody, you know, it's an obvious Sorry, thing. I'm start the show. Okay. So, we are here at a live show. <laughs> but I gotta to go. go. We, we can go on and we're going to do this again. Yeah, I'd we love are to. just we scratching could, this. Yeah, surface. we are. We are. And and thank and, you for accepting me, too. I, I, real quick, I, I it, it hit me not long ago that if something had happened to me and my tour manager had to meet the person playing my music to keep my legacy going. I don't know that he would uh, throw his arms around that guy. And uh, you right. really have accepted right. me. And, uh, I, I, it means a lot. Your love for it is shining through. It's all I care about, right? And, and you are gimmicky and you are mm. fooling it. And, and Thank uh, you. And Jerry loved that. You know, he was blown away by all musicians who were genuine. He, that's why he loved Weir so much because he told, he told me, he said, Weir plays shit I would never No, think Weir's, I, Weir, Weir plays guitar versions that are out of control um, and we and he will tonight and but this is a great way to warm up my head yeah. and heart for playing thank you well we'll go on with this uh, conversation so thank you all and thank you John so much thank for your you. time right now I know we're all under the gun here and thank you let's go showtime yes and you know when you're at live shows you have to be governed by the movements of course of what the band is doing and it was a squeeze play that day and I gotta say that under the situation John was terrific in an interview situation he really does think all this stuff out he talks about it all the time even when he's not playing or doing interviews he's thinking about all this stuff he has a great mind for the Grateful Dead world. He's studying it and he's added it to his life, which is a great story of a musician's life. Now, all musicians out there have a real difficult time. Don't ever let them fool you. It's not easy profession they've chose. They have decisions to make every time, every gig, every time they go out on stage, they stick their neck out there. And a person like John Mayer has stuck his neck out. He had a career. To do this was risky in a lot of ways, and he noticed the way he he moved into it. He moved into it in a way of grace and beauty, in my opinion, you know, and he also realized that it wasn't something he was going to just jump on and grab onto it, you know, and Many times it would come up in Jerry's talking to me, and I'm a very lucky guy to be the fact that Jerry and I spent a lot of time talking about theories of all musicians and those things. And he taught me a lot about how difficult it was for him to become a musician and to get to where he was. He couldn't believe the first time at a Grateful Dead show there were more people than there was more band members. He remembered that moment, you know. And those little things keep you humble and keep you righteous. So many musicians are good people. They really are. It's just nice because they get to play and it's called playing and we always would make note of that you know on the road they get to play and the road becomes this whole other thing around which you have to do to play and it grows and it changes if you're lucky and if you start making it and then the critics jump in in your life all the time and they constantly come after you and there's a million people out there with opinions you know and and they all want to tell you what they are and I think that I've heard it so many times where people will come up to me and say well what do you think of this guitar player what's this guy like and I've even gone I've had friends take me to shows and the guitar player who's playing the Jerry part is very conscious of the fact that I'm there and they look at me and they think i mean trey anastasio himself at fairly well when he saw me he came up to me and i hugged him and i said trey you're doing a great job 
And I looked at him and he had tears in his eyes, you know, and, and that is a thing that I realized that so many people want that recognition, you know, from those of us who were with Jerry all the time. And Jerry would give his approval to anyone who gives it a try because he believed in musicians. He always taught me that you be as nice as you can to them because they don't get many chances, even if they're so talented. And we knew so many people like that. Guys, you know, that came up as when the Grateful Dead did and other bands tried their ways. They had different management. They had different ways of doing it. And they would go off into these worlds and they would go into television shows all the time and they would go into records that were successful and they would get the almighty dollar leading them down these pathways and the golden road to unlimited devotion which the Grateful Dead stayed on it was a whole different thing and they never ever looked they had blinders on in their career they didn't go for that stuff we did it our own way who in the world would ever have thought a band would let people tape their shows that was unheard of it was a battle every time with record companies and radio stations they didn't want to play the Grateful Dead music they, it was too long everything in the old days was time oriented the shows that came before us the rock and roll cavalcades they were called that played in the Capitol theaters and the shows that uh, Alan Freed put on in the original rock and roll days and as the years went on Chuck Berry and all those people that went on the road constantly they would be on these buses and you played 45 minutes if you had a set that's the length of a set and if you didn't play 45 minutes you played less you played a half hour or you played 15 minutes or you just played your hit song and walked off and and people didn't get encores and they didn't get all this stuff that they now take for granted from bands. An encore comes from showbiz by the audience just not leaving the place going berserk until the band or the performer comes back out and gives an encore a little bit of a performance that he just gave. It actually comes from the theater and goes into that world. You see, the Grateful Dead broke a lot of rules like that and they started playing these elongated sets and eat and their songs were longer to fill those and they jammed and that was a whole other thing you know people started calling it garage bands that term was around for a long time in the 50s too because where did everybody rehearse in the garage and you know if you look at uh, guys like Buddy Holly, he started in his garage in Lubbock, Texas, and he we knew all about him, you know, how he nailed egg crates to his walls to deaden the sounds when you're in those kind of tight environments. Grateful Dead started the same way. I remember when we had rehearsal halls that were not rehearsal halls, they were literally garages and when you close the garage door the band was right up against them singing and you know that was what they were looking at a garage door that was how tight it was for our setup then slowly we got places that were bigger and the band always was rehearsing no matter what at one time it was at Jerry's house where Jerry's mom had provided some gear then Owsley provided a place and there was a place in LA that they went and rehearsed and that was called Big Pink I think they called it the Pink House you know and it was out in uh, a part of LA that was kind of rough and tumble but the guys rehearsed there every day and they lived there and that's how it was when I worked for Quicksilver we rehearsed and lived in the rehearsal hall the crew guys lived in the rooms there and in the basement and in the garage which had three stories that house did it was the only house at the time there Corey Madera in Marin County and so you learned at rehearsal halls you know you knew everything about what everybody's bank account was like what their cars they were driving what their houses were like and musicians have a tough time the Grateful Dead were kicked out of so many gigs when they started you know and, and because Pigpen and Jerry looked too scruffy they were fired from the Action House in different places and in San Mateo and other gigs when they were just starting out but you never give up. If your heart and soul is about music, you never give up. And when you listen to a guy like John Mayer, you realize he's way beyond the success of his career. He's way beyond what the success of the Grateful Dead is. He's a deep individual who thinks about everything musically in his life. And that's the way Jerry was. That's the way a lot of people were. Jimi Hendrix and a lot of great guitar players. They live like that. You never put your guitar down, you know. Uh, 
everybody who plays guitar like that, you could ask uh, any of them, they literally had their guitar strapped to them from the second they got up and they just kept playing and playing and guitar players rehearse all the time no matter what level they're on because they have to when you get up on a stage whether it be for whoever's there or you're doing a free show or i know musicians that play at old age homes and and that's not the right term anymore they're they're called rehabilitation places or this or that but they play to captive audiences you know just to play to people and to see if they smile sometimes they get criticized really heavily you have to take that everybody out there what is it not when you're playing in a tight nightclub and you're trying to get your act across and everybody's out there talking and the more they drink the more they'll talk in most places, you know, and then even Bobby himself has to say sometimes to an audience, please be quiet and listen to me when he's playing acoustic. But now if he plays, recently he and I went and played a gig in Venice Beach at a place called Toker's, and that was the opening of a dis dispensary. They'd been open for a while and it was all pot smokers in there. Well, what do you know? They were quiet quieter than an alcoholic group would be you know an alcoholic uh, thing can happen where people don't mean to but their voice check it out you get louder when you drink you know and you're talking and you still we have the same problem that Grateful Dead shows in the early days I mean the PA would be out, drowned out by people in, in small theaters sometimes and they're talking loud when you get everybody going and buzzing they're there to socialize too at shows as a musician, you get a little bit insulted sometimes. Remember the great Shakespearean actors, you know, they always would just, if somebody got up and walked out in the middle of their oratory or their soliloquy, they actually, it scars your mind. One person getting up and walking, you don't know if they're going to the bathroom, you don't know if they're going to come back, but you take it personal. Each person in the audience is related to everybody that's playing there, you know, everybody and Dead and Company, I, they, you know, even if you're not looking at it, you notice what's happening out there. You can see any disturbance from the stage. You can feel it, too, you know, and when there's a disturbance at a show, it affects the fourth dimension. And when the fourth dimension gets disrupted, things happen, ripples go out, the butterfly effect happens everywhere. And so what is it when you come to a show? You are trying to be positive. You are in a good mood. You might be inebriated. You might be on your favorite drugs. You might not. You might be just getting high from being with your friends. You might have just eaten a hot dog that sent you spinning, you know. And you might also have taken something into your own self that exists only in your mind and your mind was turned on and therefore your ass followed and where your mind goes your body will go and that's a proven fact and so when you're at a show remember that every musician up there is trying as hard as he can now some do not have the skills that others do have and that is something that shows that they maybe don't belong up there but sometimes they get there because their looks sometimes they get there because of who their agent is sometimes they get there for who they did favors for let me put it like that you know but i've seen this on all levels and even the purest of the pure you would think would not get this happening to them but it happens to bands all the time and so when you're up there playing music with people and and it's a random thing all of a sudden your band is working you're making money you then hold on to that combo you hold on to those people you cling to those people you hold on to their belt because every time you're together you can work together Together and make something happen and the Grateful Dead was no different when they first started realizing that they could have a business out of this and you start quitting your job you all live together in a communal place this is new not new business to any bands right now there's bands probably living in vans all across this country going all over the place trying to play music there always will be and there always is do they make it you have a short window too. your window is opened up and then you got a spotlight on you and if you don't perform that day uh, whatever your reasons are if you have an argument the famous story of buddy holly when he went on ed sullivan show now ed sullivan was a showcase for all young talent and he'd give you a shot on his show altercation backstage he got his front tooth knocked out 
that was stuck on with bubble gum. You know, because if you didn't go out there and screw yourself together, and Jerry did it every single day, he played every single show like that. He looked in the mirror in the morning and he screwed himself together. He didn't want to do all the stuff that you have to do to get to the show, all the stuff that you have to do to get in the showbiz or whatever you want to call it to play in front of people it takes every inch of your mind and body and it does also take away because it's like that scene that Keezy wrote in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest when the Indian chief and chief was what they called him because Keezy always told me that that is my spokesman and he never said a word and I always thought that was very unique to have a spokesman in your book because every author has a mouthpiece in a novel he writes that for a reason and Keezy his mouthpiece didn't speak he could speak but he only said juicy fruit and very few things but he does talk about it one time that when he saw his father you know and the bottle was sucking more out of him than he was getting out of it and that's what happens sometimes in showbiz when you're up there and you're putting your heart and soul out it takes from you it takes out of you and you have to replenish that some way and so the integrity of musicians, when they open their heart and soul on this show, I always listen to them because they're telling the truth about what they went through to get where they are. We've had some great musicians on talking to them, and each and every one of you them will tell you about a time when they had doubt in their career. They had to change management. They got ripped off. They got treated badly. They themselves messed up or did something crazy, you know, and then arguments occur among bands all the time when you're on top of each other like that and you start making money things change money does change all that you know you're not no longer walking around with your patched on pants and you're all hanging out together every day and your common goal is to make music let's hope that's the reason let's hope that the purity of the soul and this muse keeps it going in such a way that it'll keep all the best music rising to the surface like cream on a big old gallon of milk, you know. But those days are gone. Everything's pasteurized and, uh, what do you call, filtered. And, and fat is taken out of milk and people are watering it down, you know, and they're, they're putting adulterants in it and they're putting white paint in it just to make kids think it's white. But the thing is that music can't be adulterated. And when it is, you know it right away. And so it's a challenge every time you go out there. Make that song your own, especially in The Grateful Dead or Dead and Company. Every song was played with a dignity, and you made it your own, and you loved it. And when it was real and coming at you, and the audience is loving it, and they're paying attention, and that thing is happening, it is a symbiosis of the highest order. And it is also something beautiful to behold. And it everybody who works for a band when a band gets bigger and bigger you get more employees each one of them does their job to get those guys on that stage it just doesn't take guys waking up you know brushing their teeth getting up out of bed and pulling their pants on sometimes they don't take showers i'm sorry but you know sometimes they do and you still have to put up with all that and there was a long time where some of the famous stars in Hollywood, you know stories about them, you know, we knew some of them. They wouldn't wash their hands because they said, well, I'm so into this part, I'm going to be like this. I want the dirt under my fingernails all the time. I want to be filthy. I want to smell so I can smell like the guy I'm playing smelled. I want to become that guy. Well, if you think that a musician doesn't go through that same stuff, they do because when they're on that stage, they become, when Jerry was singing Wharf Rat, he was was walking those docks he knows what that was like when Bobby was singing his songs he was riding that horse across the desert he was there robbing and stealing and in his mind just like he was he's a great guy and he would never do that he wouldn't be that but they are making you believe it when they deliver their song they give every inch of it to you and maybe you're listening to something else sometimes and it's not quite as devoutly stuck to the storyline but you will find that good music will hit you on every level just like 
when you're in an, a museum and you see a painting that moves you. When you see a movie, you're really looking at a lot of paintings moving by, the most beautiful ones. Any director will tell you he is thinking them as scenes. You know, I like to look, watch and, and to pay attention to silent movies because people don't speak, they emote. And when you emote, you can watch one sometime, you'll see acting was of the highest form and you still know what they're saying. You still feel their emotions because we are people. We can't always hear every word we're saying and we know what's going on with each other. At the highest intensity of adrenalized moments in your life, you're still going to find that you have to pay attention to the other human beings around you because each and every one of us is connected in that way. And so when you hear somebody like John Mayer talking about playing on the Grateful Dead, when he opens his soul like that, that is a beautiful thing, you know. And so many musicians, we're going to go through a whole thing where we have a lot of the young musicians now who are, you know, doing Grateful Dead cover songs and living them and learning them the way they do. There's bands for, that represent every genre of the Grateful Dead because the Grateful Dead is made up of the blues a pig brought to them, the blues that Jerry brought in, the bluegrass that Jerry brought in, the country stuff that Bobby brought in, the music that Phil brought in through his symphonic love for all that. And every keyboard player who played with the band had a huge background in music. They were all very accomplished players and usually started at a very young age on the keyboard. Now we can talk about keyboard players and their influences on the Grateful Dead music because Jerry never liked it when a keyboard player would come into the band because that was the position that seemed to always change. If that guy wasn't being original or creative, what a challenge it was because it's so easy as the Grateful Dead became this solid machine going down the highway and their music was what it was it's a huge amount of music the book that i found in my barn recently of every song that they did that the guys would use to look at the lyrics before we had computers and before all that it's just so fat it's the fattest loose leaf i've ever seen and to learn all those songs and to give each one its weight and time and place, you better be thinking about it all the time because it was authentic on the stage. Those guys spoke to each other in a language we can only imagine that musicians are do back and forth to each other if you've ever played with those guys and I'm lucky enough to have played with them because I when we had the ass bites band we sometimes would mingle the guys would come in and play with us you know and that's the ass bites were the crew band and uh i was just looking at a picture of phil playing with me and bobby and ramrod and i in there you know and and when you realize that we did that you and jerry and i would play almost every day that there was a setup because he would be there he'd come there early to hang out and stay all day with us, you know, and so I would play drums, and he would play, and he would show me as much as he could of a, just playing like that together. You realize how high you got when you were playing music, and this thing happens where you mentally mold together, you know, and so people all want to sit in with the best musicians. You'll see it constantly. Now it's a sit-in world everywhere in music. People come join bands and sit in. It was always like that. That cross-pollination thing that goes on is the love of music that all musicians carry with them. And Mr. Mayer is of the highest grade musicians there are. And his entire way of thinking about it complements any band he's ever played in, I'm sure. And when I talked to him and he's told me about his reverence for things and his questions are always so spot on about Jerry, they're not cheap and they're not just wow how can i just do this they're going at it because i want to know what was he thinking maybe how can i play the role as good as he played it but never to try to approach it as jerry approach it as john mayer is what he does and we must remember that anybody now who steps into any of the shoes of these guys and plays with them and has that courage is given his all to that you know the way Jeff Cimenti plays piano, there is nobody that can touch that because he puts his heart and soul into it. He does it in such a way that he's not faking 
anything, not one note ever. He's nervous every day he goes up on that stage. And that is the way the drummers are. They pay attention to everything musically and they care about it. You know, Billy wakes up in the morning every gig day and just gets himself in shape to get up there because he cares about what he does up there and he doesn't fool around and he doesn't just allow anything to happen anymore because the spontaneity is controlled and the spontaneity of the music is never lost because of that beauty of them interplaying with each other. But each musician brings his integrity onto that stage and does it with his heart and soul and that's what makes a great band if that ever gets lost you know and bands have, have split up and not played for years and got back together and done reunions and they can pull that back together but it takes a while to build that back up it takes intense time together and each one of them remember this so many musicians out there have tried so hard and played so good and never made it it's a very interesting thing how bands do grab the attention of people out there. And it's different all the time, and the music business is changing right now. And I think that when you see Phil playing with all the people he plays with and the young people that he tries to play with, he is reaching out to musicians all the time with his knowledge, and he plays with so many people. And they are just in love with that fact that they can play with Phil and... and combine that musical uh, integrity and experience that Phil has with their energy and their need to play this music. And all good music is a, is a magnetic force for people to join together. And so our hats off to all the experimenters out there. Never give up with your music. Always keep trying. Always remember that don't listen to the scoffing critics out there there's plenty of them don't even understand how there can be that many but there are and everybody has an opinion as they always will in this world but you have to believe in yourself no matter what you do if you're going out right now and working on cars you better believe that what you're doing is important it's life-saving it's life-giving if you're out there selling insurance to people and doing something that you've got to screw yourself together you're doing just what everybody does when they get into a band that makes successfully make money they have to work it most musicians are playing because they've got to play and get that out of them look at whatever you do in life like that look at everything in life as a symphony look at every food that you put together a meal think of it as pieces of music being put together i've been in restaurants where recently like Providence in L.A., where those people are so incredible. It's a good friend of mine, Michael Chimusti, who's the chef there, and he's a Michelin-quality chef, but everyone who works for him, everyone in that place is there because they love it. They come in, and they have a respect for you, and you feel so special when you eat there, and you see how they put these dishes together because they're putting a symphonic thing to it they're putting it together with music love and when you have that idea in your head think about each part of your life as that too you know your family part your your work part of life your relaxation part your time of joy go for that and put it together and you see what great things we can do with a positive attitude and I hope you like listening to this show because I sure enjoyed doing it and thank you all so much uh, for everything and all your great thoughts and all the love that you put out I'm totally humbled by it and uh, I know that to have so many good people out there that are listening all we can do together is keep this thing going up and up and up. The sky's the limit. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you soon. You've been listening to the